Good afternoon. I'm Tim O'Malley. I'm the CEO of Atima Media and Marketing. Thank you for joining us. We've received an outpouring of questions about our industry during these crazy and unprecedented times. That said, we felt like there was some great value in bringing together a group of industry pros like you to collaborate uh, with this outstanding panel in order to share knowledge, ideas, and solutions. Our agenda is simple. Um, we're gonna do some quick introductions and housekeeping. We'll look at some data and then have a panel discussion with four outstanding industry professionals. We'll end with Q&A. Before we jump in, I'd like to thank my teammates at Atima for pulling this event together. We too are a smaller team as a result of coronavirus. And I can tell you that the team has been working very hard to produce this, to produce this event. So thanks to uh, Team Atima. I'll say that 10 times fast. Uh, thanks to our partners in producing this event, uh, Freeman Company, NHS Global Events, Visit Dallas, and Dot Foods, and of course our own Hospitality and Tourism Summit Chicago, and Planner Masterclass. One of our main uh, brand tenets at Atima is connecting people in order to help them and their businesses. In the past, that's meant a lot of things. On the meetings and events side of our business, it's meant physically bringing meeting and event planners, hotel salespeople, and DMCs together with vendors and venues at the Hospitality and Tourism Summit, at our planner master classes, and at our networking events. To be clear though, we never thought it would mean selling out a 500 person digital panel discussion like we did today. Uh, we're glad you're here with us this afternoon. We were just talking about, uh, the panelists and I were just talking about this beforehand. We're talking about people tuning in and tuning out and all this kind of stuff that wasn't really on our radar a month ago. So here we go. Um, we've always believed in the value of our community and we're doing everything we can right now to keep us together. We're stronger together, we're smarter together. We'll come out of this together and our city and our businesses will grow together as, as a result as well as the overall national community. So we've been producing a series of digital events to keep us together. And our next one, in fact, is tomorrow. We're very excited to be hosting a panel with three professors from Northwestern University Medill School. Um, the panel includes Kelly Cutler, who runs the program, plus Hud Engelhart and Roy Wolin, who are experts in crisis communications and digital uh, analytics, and are also active in the business world. So we'll be exploring marketing, exploring marketing strategies for our new reality. So Dylan will input a link into our chat mechanism so that you can register now if you're interested. It's gonna be a great session. Other upcoming events. So again, tomorrow's event. Uh, next week we have a virtual happy hour on May 7th at four. We're working on a safety and operations for tourism and group oriented businesses um, panel, which uh, details to come. Um, we have a Right now we have still a planner master, master class scheduled for due June 10th, but we are trying to uh, actually figure that one out because that's scheduled to be a actual old school physical event and um, we're trying to figure out the timing on that. So more to come. And then the Hospitality and Tourism Summit has been postponed. We are reimagining that event. We hope to use that as sort of a launch for the city that uh, you know Chicago's back in business come have your meetings and events here, come uh, you know, bring your family, et cetera. So more to come on that. So a little bit about who we are. Um, we help tourism and group oriented businesses connect with a number of different audiences, ranging from local meeting and event planners to hotel sales folks to DMCs. Here are our largest brands with uh, Planner Masterclass is our fastest growing brand with recent expansion into San Francisco and uh, many of which have thought or heard of uh, the other brands. So I don't wanna spend too much time on us because this is about you guys. So um, we're here this afternoon to talk about the state of the meetings and events industry. So we have a fabulous panel of industry experts here with us and each of them has impressive backgrounds and I'd like to share some of that with you through introductions, starting with David Safe. David is a leader of Freeman's uh, strategic advisory practice to association executives, event organizers, and corporate marketers. 
As associations lead, David has directed engagement to develop multi-year event and association strategies that transform experiences and deliver business results. Prior to Freeman, David led the GS Global Strategy Team with, uh, from 2007 to 2018. Prior to this, um, he spent seven years with LEK Consulting in the firm's London and Chicago offices. David serves as an ex executive board member at BPA Worldwide, is a frequent industry speaker at IAEE, PCMA Convening Leaders, Exhibitor Live, HCEA, IMEX, and Large Show Roundtable. David earned an MBA from the Wharton School and an MA of International Studies from the Lauder Institute at the University of Pennsylvania. He received his BA in Russian and Soviet Studies from Harvard College. Welcome, David, and thank you. Uh, Sean Lynch may have one title, but his day-to-day -day work at NHS Global Events includes a range of, well, everything. His versatility stems from fulfilling a range of managerial roles throughout the past 30 years. Beginning with a bachelor's degree from the University of Missouri, Columbia in business administration with emphasis in finance, marketing, and management, Sean then excelled in the financial services industry before joining the leadership team of NHS Global Events. It's the diversity of experiences and his continued learning that has made him one of the true go-to guys in the industry. And I can tell you, I haven't known him a long time, but he has been just that, so. Um, Sean has a laser focus on SMMP and new meetings and events industry trends that help his clients prosper. Sean is active in several industry associations, including serving on the Meeting Professional International Chicago Chapter Board of Directors, and serving as its president in uh, 2012 and 13. Sean is most proud of his family, Mary, his spouse, and their children, Chris, Natalie, and Ryan. Welcome, Sean, and thank you. Megan Costigan came to Dot Foods full-time in 2013 as a meeting and event planner. Dot Foods is a family-owned and operated business and is the largest food redistributor in North America. Megan is one of the 46 third generation family members. That's impressive. She and her team plan and execute more than 40 events per year, domestically and internationally, ranging from 15 to 2,800 attendees. In addition to Megan's work in the meeting and events industry, she has been heavily involved in the work of the Tracy Family Foundation, serving on the foundation's board. Her nonprofit junior and advisory board experience includes Brown Shiler, CEO, uh, Family Promise of North Fulton DeKalb, Georgia, that is, um, Girls on the Run, Chicago, and Foster and Amp Adoptive Care Coalition in St. Louis. Megan received her undergraduate degree from the University of Missouri Columbia in Hotel and Restaurant Management and has a Master of Nonprofit Management degree from Fontbonne University. During that time, she was accepted into and participated in the Exponent Philanthropy, Philanthropies Next Gen Fellowship program. Megan, thank you so much and welcome. Brad Kent, um, well this is Brad Kent's 40th year in the industry. He spent 26 years on the hotel side uh, from front desk to senior vice president of sales with Hilton and Wyndham. He spent seven years with Freeman handling accounts such as American Dental Association and PCMA. He has spent the last eight years leading sales teams in the DMO side of the business and as the head of sales for Choose Chicago with the last five years spent leading the sales team at Visit Dallas, the number five meeting city in the Cvent top 50 destinations list. Welcome Brad and thank you for coming. So okay, to get uh, our conversation started here, Brad and David have pulled together some very helpful data and insights and you can post your questions, it's a little housekeeping, you can post any questions you might have in, your, uh, in the Q&A in the app. So it's, if you look at the frame of the app on your screen, it's in the lower middle, uh, Q&A. And in fact, that's a good uh, reminder for me to tell you that the questions that I'll be asking our panelists today have come from you. Um, during registration, we asked you what were the topics and questions you'd like to uh, focus on, and uh, we collated those questions for our panelists today. Um, with that, Brad, would you like to get us started? Got a volume issue there. I think Time Magazine's man of the year is going to be, you're on mute. Because <laughs> I think if, uh, if that's not the 
three uh, most said words right now. I don't know what they are. So thank you all for having me, Tim. Thank you so much for the warm introduction. Uh, after hearing about everybody's accomplishments, I was like, somebody tell me why the hell I'm on this panel. So uh, great to be here. Great to be back with uh, so many folks from the Chicago market. I, I grew up in Chicago and spent a good part of my career with Hilton and then uh, with Choose Chicago uh, there in the Chicago marketplace. And I saw the participants, a lot of friends, a lot of customers. And so it's, it's really good to be back uh, and to be with Nora Gorman, who represents us up here in Chicago and does a really great job. Chicago is a big feeder market for us, so thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for being here. I uh, hope everybody's in good health and you all have uh, either been able to avoid the virus or you have recovered from the virus. Uh, and as, we, uh, as we're seeing, it, it does seem like we're turning a corner of some sorts. I don't know what that means, and we can talk about some of that. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the, most of the data I'm going to talk about you're going to see for Dallas, but, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to my counterparts in every city, and I think most of this data will apply to about any city you want to think about. And then also, you know, the, the big questions are how do we open and how do we start going and, you know, how are we going to seat people in a room and how are we going to do a lot of the things that, that we've never had to talk about before. Um, and then uh, also thank you to the customers who are still booking meetings and still find face-to-face -face valuable uh, to accomplish their business objectives because I still think as nice as this is as an alternative, um, I still believe face-to-face -face is, is the way we go as, a, as an industry and bring this country back. So I'm going to hit the button. There we go. So here's an overview of, of what I want to talk about. I need to move my uh, pictures here. So, you know, all of our destinations are devouring as much information as possible to answer that question I saw in some of the questions that were posted is, you know, uh, when's it going to end? When's the, in when's the industry going to recover? Uh, as we're seeing, not all destinations are going to be opening in the same ways. Uh, different states are going to do different things, and within states, different municipalities are going to do different things. Nationally, the recovery is projected to be where we were on February 29th, five years from now. And so that is in terms of the revenues, that's in terms of the attendances, that's in terms of literally uh, for the hotel side, uh, most of the delay is gonna be in rate discounting um, based on historical patterns. And most of the time we're looking at 2008, 9, 10 with the financial crisis, or we're looking at 9, 11, um, where rate discounting is how a lot of folks started uh, selling. But there's a real lack of availability. We know in the fall, it's very hard to find dates for customers out there. And the lack of availability is gonna impact the rates. I don't think nationwide are gonna go down that much um, just because I think there's gonna be a lot of competition for available dates as, as uh, organizations need to meet. Uh, business is, you know, this word normal, uh, business is not gonna go back uh, to what it is. Uh, used to be 10%, all the, and I've got some, some statistics on consumer feelings and expectations around behaviors. Only about 10% of travelers say they're going to jump back in. Uh, there's a lot of concerns about cleanliness and safety, uh, you know, certainly with planes, with hotels, with restaurants, with uh, other attractions, convention centers, and things like this. And I know in Chicago, ISSA and the GBAC initiative are, uh, are certainly addressing things like that. Um, even if these event organizers are going to be bullish and hold events, you know, it's the old saying is, um, will they come and what are the attendees thinking? And then who's responsible for all the increased cost to hold an event? Those are all things that I think we're all wondering about. I don't have the answers, but this is, this is what we're looking at as a nation. Okay, this is, this is what uh, revenue looks like in Dallas, but uh, from what I'm talking about with all my other folks, so we used to, we used to um, bring in as a bureau about $1.1 billion of revenue. We're expecting that to really bottom out at about a half a, half a million, or a half a billion, 500 million in January. That's when we think, we really believe things are gonna bottom out. As you'll see, that's a slow climb back to maybe getting into 24 or 25 before we see real recovery. Um, this again, um, as you can see, this kind of captures three things. The gray line is where we were pre-crisis. Okay, the blue line is what happened to occupancy. As you can see, occupancy went down much sooner and much faster than rate did, uh, but rate you know, certainly soon followed. And as you can see, occupancy is gonna come back, meetings are gonna come back, travelers are gonna come back, business travel will come back. 
Um, that'll come back soon, but we really won't see a recovery. Whether that's attendees at a meeting, at a trade show, I talked to several trade show organizers and they're concerned about their revenue for the next several years. Um, so it, we are seeing certainly on, on our side. That also affects then, how are we gonna invest in cleaning hotels and cleaning convention centers? If, if rate discounting starts, how are we gonna be able to afford masks and how are we gonna afford gloves and how are we gonna do these things? We're gonna have costs never before seen in this industry. Who's going to pay for them? How's that going to be handled? Without price and without um, revenues and, and profits, it's going to be hard, certainly for the supplier side, to, to make that happen. Um, if, if we see rates recover quicker, I think this is what um, uh, STR is looking at in terms of recovery in Dallas. And the STR folks tell us that's pretty much what recovery is going to look like everywhere. If price doesn't drop off the face of the earth, we may well see recovery in, in late 22. So that, you know, that'd be about a two-year two year recovery, which would be unprecedented in terms of uh, live events and, and travel and tourism. And then you can kind of see here as you compare to pre-9-11 and 9-11, as you compare to the pre-financial and the financial, and then as you compare. This thing is nine times as bad as those two combined. Okay, as you can see, there was a dip after 9-11, and there was a dip and a slow, slow flattening of the curve in both of those. This thing truly has fallen off the earth. In, in Dallas, we have 22 hotels closed. Most of the rest are running one or two percent occupancy. Uh, most of our restaurants, a lot are closed, but the rest are, as we all know, don't carry out, etc. So this is hitting about every sector of the world we can even imagine. So um, here is room demand. Um, I'm gonna move my thing again, the pictures are in there. So this was, this was the previous 365 days and Dallas has been getting a lot of great demand, but as you can see, you're talking about, you know, five to six billion room nights, right? So uh, here's awarded room nights. This is all CVET data, this is actual, transactions done, okay, and awarded is about almost 900, a little over 800,000 with Orlando and Chicago leading the way. And then this is since uh, March 21st. Uh, we've, we've gotten, we're now up to about 421 leads uh, since March 21st, but that is compared to about eight or 900 the year before. So while there, you know, there is still demand, there, there's a lot of government stuff. Uh, one of our hotels just put an 1800 peak room night uh, Department of Defense group. So I do think some of the government stuff may help out some of the states and some of the destinations. But as you can see, it's been a big fall off from where we were. And then this is, as we are seeing, and, and again, this comes from CVET, these are the RFPs received. And as you can see, um, we are seeing a big lift as you look at current versus previous, okay? We are seeing that as we get to August and then we see September and October, we are seeing business start to climb back after the big gap from March, April, May, comparing previous to current. And so we are seeing that the, uh, the trend lines are starting to return to normal in terms of sourcing of business, okay? And this is business being sourced for those arrival dates, okay? So that is, Business being sourced now for July, August, September, October, November, and December is starting to follow the trend line that existed before. So that would tell me that groups are thinking, okay, we're going to get back out there in July. We're going to get back out there in August, September, October, November. With that returning the trend line and so, many, so much other business already on the books is why there's now going to be an availability crisis as groups try and find availability in 20 and then into 21. Um, so, you know, it goes back to the thing of if you plan it, will they come? So there's an organization called Destination Analysts that has provided uh, the information I'm going to share with you. This is on consumers. This is talking to consumers about what, how they're feeling, what they're thinking. This is more about your attendee. The previous stuff's all about the organizer. This is now about the attendee, their feelings, their expectations. So uh, as you can see here, uh, cruises are not going to be popular. I don't think that would surprise anybody here. Um, but crowded destinations, um, their, their, their feelings, it used to be 49.8% would, um, would go. It's gone up to 55.7 since March. 
Um, attending conferences or conventions, it was about 34% a year a uh, month ago, and it's up to 40. And then destinations that were slow to put social distancing measures in place, starting to rise, starting to believe in those destinations again. Whoop, went too far. There we go. Um, Road trips, um, those of you in Chicago who have a pretty big 300 mile radius of drawing from a huge population will see some benefit that it is rising. It kind of bottomed out there as you can see in terms of like Gen X um, bottomed out, you know, April three to five, it's coming back. It's now up to about 48% in the, in the most recent. Um, and then as you can see, the baby boomers are not, not that, um, not, they're rebounding faster in terms of air travel versus uh, car travel. And uh, so it is nice to see that the sentiment, but if you were planning a conference, I would certainly allocate a lot of your money to promoting in the 300 mile radius um, to, to draw more of that local uh, business uh, than you did in the past. And then what kind of places are people gonna uh, prefer? Uh, beach and resort, obviously more spread out, uh, small towns, villages, rural destinations, and attractions. But cities are still holding their own. Cities and metropolitan areas are still holding their own um, as far as places people will go. I don't think we will see people avoid the Chicago's and New York's and Dallas's and stuff of the world. So those are pretty popular, are pretty positive signs, and they're all getting better. So I'm going to turn this now over to David uh, with Freeman because I know he is a better presenter and he's got a bunch of great data on. How are we going to meet in the future and what ways? David, take over. Okay, we, we, we talked about lowering the bar. Lowering the bar, Brad. Uh, give me a minute here and I am going to just share my screen. And that was great. I mean, that was excellent data. I, there was one, one or two slides where Brad went on and I just thought, uh, there we go. Can you guys see my screen okay? Yep. All right, good. Yeah, there's one or two slides I got a little worried. I just thought maybe we could move to like the happy hour with drinks. And then like we saw that turn of the tide and the excitement and, you know, all great stuff. So um, that was really, that was a great setup in terms of sharing the data and the trend of where things are going. Um, we've been doing a bunch of research and we've been collating a bunch of research from different sources. And I'm going to share with you some of the things that we're seeing. And um, I saw one or two questions out there, so I'm gonna try and address those as well. Um, but, you know, there is this question, and I, and I hear it from people, you know, when is it going to, when is it gonna recover? And it's gonna be speculative. I mean, I'm gonna give you some of the signals that we're watching, and that I think would be smart for us all to watch. Um, you know, we're all kind of going through this phase. I don't know, everyone on this call is probably in a different phase, and this is actually from the last downturn of uh, how we're, we're responding to the current situation. It is difficult. It is challenging. Um, you know, in, in our minds, live is alive and well in a totally different way today. I know a lot of people think of live as on-site live. Um, I'm gonna mention something called transmedia, which is really going across platforms. But live is not, is not on hiatus. It's completely changed for the time being. And as Brad rightly notes, Different cities, different places are coming back in different ways. I'm gonna to touch on that and how to think about that. Um, but the reality is, you know, every one of us, and many of us are probably in the Illinois, Chicago area, but not everybody. I've seen a, a bunch of people on, and you're, I know you're in different cities. And so we're all encountering this in our own different way. We're all seeing it in our own different way. Uh, but I think the key is kind of arming you with some knowledge and some ideas of how to manage through it. This is from McKinsey. Um, and, you know, the big issue was uncertainty is understanding how long it'll last and when it'll come back. And I thought, you know, Brad has great data. What was really good about those charts was those are RFPs in the system or their actual rates and inquiries or their, their bookings and dialogues. So that was a great barometer of what, you know, Brad's seeing and, and what we're seeing for other cities. Um, but that uncertainty of how long it's gonna last and what does it mean for me and how do I adapt? What does it mean for my local economic circumstances? And I would say one thing, we were talking about this before the webinar started. We are, for most of us, in a, in a singular event that none of us have seen, whether you've had two years of experience or 50 years of experience. I think the other piece is, it's a huge opportunity for people right now to, to try things and do things and really get out there and change the conversation about how you connect 
and make sure that you as a steward or as a partner to a community, you're continuing the dynamic community and how it convenes the way it which convenes. And I'll touch on that in a, in a minute or so. In terms of what we're watching, so this is from IMI, but this is, this is I think, a really key slide to think about. I'm gonna call out a bunch of percentages here. When, when, we're, when people were surveyed about what are you watching for? What are the key things that are gonna change your perspective? A vaccine that's validated and available to everyone, 71% of the people said when there's a vaccine available to everyone, that's gonna change my behavior. That's gonna tip me into a different perspective. When the CDC, the Center for D Disease Control in the US, announces the threat is over, 52% said that will change my behavior. When the US Surgeon General uh, announces that the threat's over, 40% of the people are gonna change their behavior. It gets a, low, a little bit lower when it comes to changing social distancing. So 36% said when social distancing is eliminated, uh, that'll change my perspective. 31% said all businesses back open and 30% said the World Health Organization will announce the threat is over. I think the key here is that vaccine, watching the vaccine and on average, um, when asked, you know, how long would it take you to get back to some form of the new normal, it was 178 days. So in other words, once we've got a, a validation that we've got a vaccine that is validated and accessible, there's going to be about a 180 day lag before we get to the new normal. So I would be watching that. Now there's been some articles the last day or two about a team in Britain that might have a vaccine that's validated in September. It might be there are about 20 different teams. There's a bunch of people teaming up here. So whether it's validated, but then accessible is a different question. It might be another three or four months for uh, that being accessible. But that's one signal I would watch for is what's going on with vaccine development, vaccine approval. And then I would count, you know, within 180 days, a new normal is what we're watching for. The CDC is obviously, if, if you're dealing with international attendees, CDC is not as relevant. Um, we're seeing good news from Australia, but kind of watching the authorities and what they say, particularly the scientific or the health authorities, and what they're announcing for uh, the imminent threat. So these are key signals. You know, when we go back to uncertainty, the things that we watch for because they're going to be announced by leading scientific health authorities, and then we can make plans accordingly. Now, when folks ask, this is a, a survey of performance research, more on the festival side and outdoor event side, what's your expected uh, participation? 44% uh, said, sorry, yeah, 44% said they'd be attending fewer events in the future. 38% said they'd be doing about the same events in the future. And 18% said they would be attending more events in the future. This is based on research in the last three weeks. As we get to greater certainty, as we see some of these, these the vaccine and some of the announcements get, get to a safer place, I expect this perspective to change. But the reality is this large gathering is going to be a pause for a lot of people until they feel safe. In fact, in the last week or two, um, Facebook and Microsoft announced they would not be doing any live events over 50 people until June of next year, which is interesting because it's a random date. It, it, it doesn't really tie to what science or health authorities are saying. And I think one of the things we need to bear in mind as stewards, whether we're partners or hosting events, I'd be looking at 60 to 70 percent of your audience, where they come from, and what are the health standards in that originating city? And then how does that contrast to the health standards where you're hosting your event? And wherever is the higher standard, that's where I'd be aiming to make sure that my partners and my venues and my hotels are adhering to that standard. We're seeing a lot of that in Dallas and Chicago and other cities. There have been a, numerous meetings between health authorities and convention and hotel authorities to coordinate all this. And as an organizer, you need the peace of mind of knowing they're adhering not just to a base standard, but to a standard that's going to get to 66% or 70% of your audience. So I would bear that in mind. For those of you who have international attendees, a little more complex because you've got another 150 countries to think about. But I think it's making sure that the standards that you're hosting are at or above where the majority of your folks are originating from. So keep that in mind as we go through this. Now, I said earlier that it is about transmedia, and I want to explain what I mean by that. So for anyone in the events industry, and pretty much everyone on this webinar is in the events industry, it's all about content storytelling. We've been doing it live. We've been creating awesome events and great gatherings together. We've been creating interviews and panels, point counterpoint, lots of great things here. But as we go to a world which is in the near term is affected, in the longer term, I think we need to just think about transmedia, meaning 
how do you tell a story across multiple channels? And the reason why I want to highlight this, and again, this comes from Global Web Index, the, the reason why I want to highlight to, to this one, this, this chart to you is not just the online video, because that's pretty obvious, but when you look down the millennial column, what you see is that millennials, when it comes to podcasts and live streams in particular, and even the online press, they're higher consumers of these formats and these channels. And so we, a lot of people have called up and said, hey, David, should I do something online and create an online event? Yes, you should do an online event, but that's not all. And by the way, this is the other thing I would just say right now. Don't think about taking your physical event and putting it online. Because if you think about it, when you go to the supermarket and you go to, whether it's the Jewel or the Whole Foods, whatever supermarket is, and then you go to Amazon, you don't see aisles and you don't see end caps. They don't do it that way. So for those of you who are thinking, I want to take my physical event and put it online, think about the channel, think about the experience, and think about the fact that for millennials and Gen Z, they were born into it. And they're born into an efficient click-through experience that gets them what they want or anticipates what they want, recommends five other things that even think they, they didn't even realize they needed. So think about what your content is, what's the best way to deliver, how to make sure you've got dynamic speakers, and thinking about podcasts, live streams, online, not just the online event, but a multi-channel approach. And by the way, when things come back to the new normal, and, and you know, there's, a, there's a, a parable that says people need about 66 to 70 days to, to gain a habit, we're all gonna be in place for about 66 to 70 days on average. So there are gonna be new habits that are formed, let's adapt to the new reality. When it comes to being online, there's a variety of different times on here depending on what sector you're in. But I wanna call out two things. One, this sec session link includes Q&A, 10, 10 to 15 minutes of Q&A. So before you think I can do 56 minutes as an association, add in Q&A, you can't. It's about 35 minutes. In fact, we, as, and we have had huge growth in the online events that we're doing with clients right now. The most effective uh, length of a session right now, 18 minutes. So go on to a TED Talk, take a look at a TED Talk. That's 18 minutes. That's the perfect length. Adult viewing habits are about 10 minutes of focus attention. You got another eight minutes to keep them going. After that, you start to lose them. You can see your average times here. And you know, of course, there are gonna be other industries, but generally, the, the idea of a 90 minute, two hour session is out the window. Let's make sure you're keeping it short. Similarly, as we bring events, live events, and by the way, the one thing I should say about online, you should be doing remote activations. Why not deliver lunch to people where they are? Or there's a possibility within bounds of having cars get together in a parking lot, watching a movie screen. We've seen that popping up. So, or we're gonna see the growth of regional. Maybe it's 100 people socially distanced in a key nexus, and then you've got 20 other cities in maybe underutilized restaurants or smaller facilities that are linked through hybrid. That's gonna be our next step as we go from online to regional hybrid to back to live as these other steps come into play. Um, so a couple other things I do want to call out. We're, we're getting a lot of interest in co-locates. How can you and another event combine into a win-win? A lot of interest in, if you have a facility and you've underutilized rooms or underutilized uh, spaces for the future, whether it's later on this year or it's 21, how do we create win-win? Some people are talking about citywide. Well, no, different organizations that haven't teamed up in the past, they're talking about big blockbusters next year. So just to cap it all off here, the road ahead is different from the past. So we're not going back to live events. We're going to something new that's gonna include hybrid. Develop your action plans based on signals. Develop your contingency plans based on the way the signals are coming through and what the likely expectancy around of a vaccine and accessible, uh, accessible vaccine to the CDC. Make sure you're being audience centric. Think about the millennials and the Gen Z. They operate differently than Gen X. Create content across transmedia and then I mean, it's, it's going to be the rule for the next five years. Content is king. So in the past, it was okay to sell space and hope that people connect. You need to curate an entire experience across these channels. With that, I just want to say thank you, Brad. Thank you, Tim, very much. And Dylan, I'll hand it back to Tim, and we'll go off to the um, panel. You're on mute, Tim. Tim? You're on mute. There we go. There we go. I was trying to be nice. <laughs> uh, so thank you, gentlemen. You did a great job. It's a great foundation of information for our conversation here. Um, 
So I thought one of the things that we talked about a couple of times was this idea that regional uh, markets are going to be um, more important because of issues with travel and so forth that you brought up earlier. So what do we think is a, um, how can we capitalize on that? How can we, you know, focus on that business and, uh, and help to, to drive us as we get back to the, the, or the, the old times, if that happens? Thoughts? I, I, I guess I'll go first. I, I was on the association forum board and we just had a um, scenario planning thing and took three different scenarios. The, the worst of which is, you know, we're going to be, we're going to be sheltered in place for two more years. And then the, uh, um, I think as you look at those, I think as we see the things on uh, drive audiences, I think the longer this is, the more at risk national associations are. And the better position are things like association forum and regional organizations, almost like you, you might see super regionals. Um, but I think the longer it is, national associations would have the most trouble because they're drawing from a wider area. But certainly, I think state associations, regional associations will end up picking up and may, may well do much better uh, with combination of live and, and hybrid. It's a good perspective. Any other thoughts? Yeah, Tim, I would add, you got to really follow David's um, signals um, until we really hit, you know, with the vaccine being the farthest signal out there, that we're going to have to really wait to uh, plan some of these regional events. You, you can plan them, but you have to work with your supplier partners to have lower performance, attrition, attendance, food and beverage minimum. You have to plan on the uh, social distancing and things like that. So as David shared, the next, next nexus will be regional. And they'll go grow from there, but I think the they will they will go national and international as soon as that vaccine monitor hits. Yeah, the, the one thing I would just add is I think we're going to see a lot of great creativity that came out of this, right? So I live right by an association near me that has a, an auditorium for two hundred people and a space for interactivity that could be connected to a space downtown on McCormick, and I think we can have restaurants that are underutilized right now in the morning that are underutilized. We could have showrooms that are adjacent to some of these venues where the venue is still going to be the critical nexus. But I've got a client where they're saying, I've got to take my audience. And I can only accept a certain number of people every day for three days. I'm not going to sell three-day passes. I'm going to sell three one-day passes. But I want to use, in this case, San Diego for other activities for those folks that I can't put in the convention center because of distancing rules. So there's going to be, a new, I think, a really interesting opportunity for destinations and venues should creatively think about cities and how to create experiences for larger events. And on a regional basis, it's gonna work the same way. I think it'll go regional first, and it's gonna be more creative than we see in the past. And then we are gonna see these kind of models until, and hopefully we get to a point where we don't have to have some of those social distancing rules and practices in place as much. We'll still have to have hygiene and health and safety. Um, so, as we continue to look at this and you know another trend that is is sort of on the edges of what we just talked about and what you mentioned earlier is is the safety aspect and for the immediate sort of growth of the industry communicating that safety is important how do you suppose we do that effectively i think um so i've received for example a lot of e-newsletters from um, hotel chains and various venues. And I think just that open and honest communication, being transparent about what the venues are doing. Um, when you're honest about it and you're open about it, people know what you're doing. They feel more comfortable and therefore they feel more, feel more safe. I think um, it's going to play a, um, a big part of the risk management plan. As a planner myself, we think about that into the future. It's going to play a much bigger role as well. Yeah, I would add that pre-COVID, we worried more about uh, safety, security from active shooters and those types of concerns just 60 days ago. Uh, so now sanitation and uh, health safety will be predominant. And Brad mentioned the cost for these venues, whether they're uh, having masks available for everybody, Purell, et cetera, the, uh, the uh, ultraviolet uh, lights and all the other thermo readers that are available and are coming out there. So that cost is going to be a basis of an, um, investment for these venues. And the people that go faster are going to be able to host these regional meetings sooner. So um, as we look at that, 
you know, we're talking about sort of how we're starting and growing out of this. What's the right time to start selling here? Is it now? Is it, is it past? It sounds like, Brad, you've had some success already in Dallas in the last few weeks. What do you think? It's when the customer wants to be sold. Uh, most customers, you know, t- really, we, you know, we've, we've done some online um, margarita parties and we've done a, you know, a lot of, a lot of things with clients just to spend time together. It's, it's kind of, you know, the benefit of this, and I'm not even going to talk about the virus. I'm going to talk about, call it a business interruption, right? Everybody's business has been interrupted. All of us were going about 400 miles an hour. I think we can all agree prior to that. And, and there has been a benefit of slowing down. I think there's been a benefit of spending time with our families. Um, I, I think I've spent more time with my sales team now than, than it would be in a day-to-day situation. Um, I think it's been the same with our customers. I think some of the some of the opportunities that have come to us was, you know, some of, we just said to our salespeople, don't sell them anything. Just check in, see how they're doing, you know, what's going on in their lives. Because um, all of us, you know, everybody has a story to tell. And, and if you can give them some time to talk about it and whatnot, um, they still have business needs. Um, they're still, they're, associations still have members that want to get things done and corporations still have things they need to do. And um, we're seeing, we're seeing that, um, if, if we're, we're see, we have to stay in touch with our customers because, I mean, I'd hate to be perceived as the supplier that cares about you when you have a lead and times are good, but they don't hear from me when they're going through a tough time. I mean, we always say it's a relationship business. It's about partnering. So uh, we're not doing any hard selling. Um, we are, you know, we're, we're like everybody else. We're trying to figure this out. Um, I think we are entering into some initiatives. I know that ISSA in Chicago, um, is doing a, a, a with their the new merged partner, a Global Bio Risk Advisory Council. Um, they're they're endeavoring with a lot of the industry organizations as far as um, even before we can we can talk about how we're going to seat people in a room is how are we going to clean them, right? How are we going to have standards and protocols as to what is you know you ask me did I clean the convention center? Of course we did. Right, the way we always have, we vacuumed and we dusted and we washed the floors and we did all those things. But the question is, did you remove pathogens? Did you get rid of really uh, sanitize? And that's where I think ISSA, which of course was International Sanitary Supply, is. Uh, they're in the business of this, and I think that they're coming out with some protocols and some things that will help us as an industry ensure the comfort, confidence and um, mitigate some of the fear of attending. Um, and it's got to apply to the airplanes. It's got to apply to the airports. It's got to apply to the Ubers. It's got to apply to the hotels. It's got to apply to the restaurants, the museums, the convention centers. And David, you're right. I mean, there's so many venues now that become, as, as events are smaller, so many venues that become in play, but they also have to be healthy, clean, and safe for everybody. Yeah. I agree. I, I mean, I, I would just say this. We, we may be in a different place We've had, we've seen explosive growth on online. A bunch of associations and our corporate clients are saying, how do we create a compelling experience online? We've had a bunch of sponsoring corporate partners calling us and saying, I've got these events, they're asking me to participate. What's the best way to do it? I think that's one piece of the puzzle. Now, not, not everybody can do that. We've got a platform, we've got a dialogue to do that. But I think wherever you are, I think it's having a relevant conversation for some associations, by the way, We've crunched the numbers. They're at risk. They've had 80 to 90% of their revenues come from one channel in the last 40 years, and that's live events. And now they're realizing they got to pivot and pivot fast. So we're working with them on a content-led transmedia or multi-platform approach, one. Two, creating an ongoing dialogue and a valuable one. So just in the same way that some corporations were saying, I don't know if it's worth it to, to exhibit, we need to create a great activation for them with their audience through online channels and through remote activation. So whether, like I said, delivering lunch, we had Tim, you guys hosted an event two weeks ago and there was a great wine glass activation that really got people thinking about the partner and engaging the audience. I think that's a step-by-step process. It's the empathy, it's creating value for customers, and then it's creating, whether it's small symposia online, then it's small to regional symposia, for you know, different audiences or maybe it's specific audiences and then getting back into those large events step-by-step. Step. But I think the key is get there, really focus on content, focus on audience 
and help connect your corporate partners to their target audiences meaning in a meaningful way. And, and, you know, I think it's good to look at health and safety. I, honestly, I feel great about the health and safety authorities working with the venues and the hotels. I believe they will absolutely provide a safe event, airlines and restaurants. The key is you're connecting with the, with your audience and making sure they feel that you've got your arms around them and you're giving them a channel to connect with one another and share how they're feeling and share best knowledge because that incubator that live events does right now, it's kind of gone on hold a bit and we can't afford to do that for the, for the good of, I mean, our economy, but also just our humanity. David, the, the, the one place I will say on, on the health organization, and, and, and we're dealing with this right now, so we, we want to be able to say that Dallas is one of the cleanest cities you can meet in. The problem is asking hotels to spend money now when they're going to go three, four months with no revenue. Restaurants, some of these restaurants don't have two pennies to rub together uh, to much less spend, you know, the amount of money. So one of the things we're trying, what we're going to try and do is uh, literally create a fund, if we can do that, um, to help some of these, you know, the large restaurant companies aren't, aren't the issue, as we all know. Right? It's those little mom and pops that make the, the vibe of the destination, right? And those are the folks that are really going to need our help as far as, um, you know, just being able to have some kind of, 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 you know, like the American Dental Association seal on your toothpaste, your mouthwash, the UL on your extension cords, that good housekeeping seal of approval, is how do we as an industry have, have something that everybody can agree is, if I see that, you know, I, I feel good. Just, hey, if Freeman handles a meeting as a destination, I feel good. And that same, we, we have to look past trademarks to, to trust funds now. It's going to be a lot of trust involved. Tim, I would add to your sales comment. Um, there's, if you have value add, you should always be selling. It's a consultative sales process, and you should be consulting on virtual platforms and other types of things, the uh, safety, et cetera. So, I think that's an absolute. It's always a good time if you're value added. If you're an order taker or something, you need to change your ways. You have to add to your resume. You have to learn learn during this time. Try to seek out certifications, other types of things to really boost your resume to be a better person coming out of this relative to being a business person. We are in the hospitality business, but it is a business. And Brad and everybody's point, there's going to be a lot of bankruptcies. There's personal um, pain going on now with regard to lack of payroll and other types of things. So it's very important to really do what you're supposed to do and, uh, and really find that purpose and go out and trying to bring value to your organization and yourself. Thank, thanks, Sean. Megan, I'm, I'm interested in your perspective as a buyer. And uh... Yeah, as, you know, as a buyer, I would say we, you know, we are just like every other company out there postponing and canceling events because we don't have any other options right now. Um, but as a planner and a buyer, that leaves time that maybe we wouldn't otherwise have had to get more educated on new venues, um, new hotels, renovations that are happening, new destinations we haven't been to before. So I think as a supplier, keep that in mind when you're reaching out to your business partners and your customers. Um, that should be part of the conversation because this is such a good time when, as a planner, we have that extra time to really learn and educate um, ourselves on what's out there. That's a really good point, making the best of what you have. So we're talking about like what the right timing is now. So as we start to see some of the signs that, uh, that uh, Brad and David put in front of us earlier. Um, and we're starting to have those conversations with folks about face-to-face uh, -face meetings. How do we drive home the importance of having face-to-face -face meetings? Well, I, mean, I, I would just say this. One, I think it's important to reinforce, I mean, Megan uh, pointed out very well, we've seen this from a couple of associations. This, it's a tragic time for a lot of people and empathizing with them is critical. We've seen a number of organizations that have opened up their online platforms for certification or training to allow people who are unemployed or going through a rough patch to at least upskill, which is, it's a great way to reinforce that you're there for your community. Likewise, it's to, to introduce tools, whether they're low cost or they're, uh, free platforms. We see, by the way, a lot of free platforms, particularly in the corporate side, to allow people to exchange ideas, 
to talk about and ideate on how we can get back on our feet or how we can grow again. And I think it's a mix of those activities where one, we're providing resources accessible to people and especially thinking about those who are directly impacted that may not have a uh, tech or they may not have, uh, you know, they're in, a, they're in an uncertain situation. So it shows the value of that community. Two, it's providing that platform support for folks to exchange ideas, provide demos, provide that exposure. Uh, we've seen a bunch of people, by the way, who are taking the time right now to completely rethink the event. So everything we've ta taken for granted from how people come in, getting a badge. I mean, now we have to think about temperature checks. We need to think about wristbands or lanyards that, that signify that you are able to come, you're appropriately there. But also, there are a lot of things that we've had in the live events industry that frankly has been friction that adds no value. And so we've had a lot of folks that we're talking to now that are saying, I totally want to rethink what we've done and how we've done it. And I think this is a great time to do that. My, my sense through the tragedy is that we're going to be more innovative in what we come back with in the new normal. And this is the time to take advantage of that space to do it. Um, for those people who kind of wait for everything to come back, as Brad kind of pointed out, you may be in a position where you're competing for space and you're competing for rooms versus rethinking and re-gearing. And at the same time, again, I'll just say there are a couple of so not just a couple, that have really opened up their arms to support people through the pain. And I think they're gonna be richly rewarded on the back end for being there for people. And yes, they're taking a, a hit probably to subscriptions or maybe membership fees right now. But I think it's a short-term investment for a long-term game. Not everybody can do it. But if you can be, have that empathy and providing that source of you know, learning, is, is, this is the time to do it. Yeah, let me, let me add to that. Uh, and, and seeing Megan here, I, I know there's a bit of an age disparity. She's much older. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, but I do think, you know, had a conversation recently with some folks in the industry. I believe, and, and David, I think this speaks right to your point too, is I think this business interruption is going to be the time that the millennials have moved past the boomers. I think this is going to create, create that great shift of, I think the millennials are going to move past the boomers because they have a different perspective. They have uh, change ideas versus many of us that have been in the industry know that, you know, we keep wanting to go back to the old normal. Well, um, there were some flawed things, as David said, there was friction and there were some flawed things with that. But I, I guess I'd ask Megan too, this is, you know, from a leadership in the industry standpoint, from the leadership in the meetings and, and changing um, organizations that have been doing things the same way for a long time at face-to-face -face events, how, are you, how do you look at an event vis-a-vis -vis older leadership and, and do you see that, that you, are, you or others are potentially going to have more of a voice as we go forward? In the, I do believe there's going to be, this is going to be the thing that makes that, that big switch. Yeah, I mean, I think to a certain extent, definitely. I think when you talk about face-to-face -face meetings versus virtual, um, we as humans, I, we all crave social interaction. We love being around people. Um, and so I don't think, and I've had multiple conversations with lots of people about this, face-to-face -face is never going to go away. It will always be there. I think um, the virtual and all the technology, that's going to become used more heavily, and it's forced some people or companies that didn't um, like technology or didn't want to embrace it, it's forced them to embrace it and learn it. And so I really think it's going to become um, just more heavily used to become, um, reach a broader audience and from that um, aspect rather than taking over or um, devaluing the face-to-face. -face. That's really interesting. Brad, I think you, you both brought up good points, but you, you definitely see everything differently and in, including the people you work with and so forth. And you see like your point, Brad, where some people are really attacking this as an opportunity and some people not so much. And so um, I think you're right. I think this is going to be have a lot of impact on who's leading the industry going forward. Um, so, so as we, again, we talk about um, coming out of this and, and starting to see some face-to-face -face meetings. What do you think of the specific types of events that you think will be the first to come back? Well, I'll jump in there and to transition. If you look at some of the leaders in the industry, then I'll answer your question, Tim. 
Vegas has to open up with live events. That is what they are. They're, they don't have Dallas or they have other business. So you can really look to Vegas to what they're doing. Um, I think a shout out goes to Wynn with their sanitation program. Uh, Marriott and then Hilt came out with the program today. So I think you can follow leading um, providers that have always been there, uh, Freeman for sure, and see what they're doing. Then you go to like, what's going on in the world? How many weddings have been canceled? So NHS Global Events, we do not do weddings. We do do galas or special events. So uh, a young bride and groom are having a tough time. So I do see those coming back first, just thinking of weddings in the wedding season. And maybe the um, people at the um, comorbidity risk won't be invited because uh, there will be social distancing. I think we're gonna have to get used to wearing masks for quite a while and other types of things, but I do see the weddings, 50 people up to 100, 125. And with that, business meetings also. Um, it's very effective as a leader to have a strategic planning meeting, but it's not very easy to do of a virtual uh, platform. It's better to look people face to face. So I see some of those coming back as well. Very good. I, 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 would, I would agree. I mean, we're, we're talking to clients right now and they're talking about small, uh, symposia, so 100, 150, I think we're going to possibly see 200, you know, it depends on what the restrictions are in different zones. But like I said, I, I think we are going to see, I, I would call it clusters of people who are committed to being face-to-face -face that feel like I cannot gain the information or make the contacts in a meaningful way, the way I, I saw before. And by the way, when we see events to come back, We've already been dealing with some customers who are saying, what am I gonna do with the folks that have a phobia around hygiene? And we may or may not see those people. And I feel for them, and I wanna make sure we have channels to reach them. But the reality is that people are gonna to come to live events, whether they're small or they're larger meetings, are gonna people are gonna be the people that realize the huge benefits of being in person versus, you know, the folks who are always on the fence, they may go virtual and they may get their certification until they realize until they can get their hands on and get a hands on lab or hands on demo, they're not going to get to the next level of their career or their profession, then we may have that dynamic. But I think you are going to see the regional meetings coming quicker. I think we're, like I said, I think we're going to see some creative use of facilities, both the, the facilities we think about, the convention centers, and, and the smaller meeting areas that even some things that we have not thought of conventionally that may be used. And, you know, Brad calls out a really important point of, Having that, you know, whether it's a UL or a label or something that gives you the peace of mind of knowing, I don't have to ask 1,400 questions about whether they've done the right standards. It meets a, a level standard. I think that's going to be a brilliant way to give people that peace of mind. And I think no matter what, we're going to need to capture uh, content or live stream. Not Well, weddings are a little different. Even weddings may have to go live stream the way we're seeing with funerals right now, unfortunately. But, you know, we have, are going to have to use technology. And frankly, this probably was a moment where millennials knew that, that this is going to have to be a channel that people adapt to. And this is our pivot moment to say, we have to incorporate these channels instead of thinking them as a, you know, some kind of stepchild. And I think we've kind of been stepchild to some of these live streaming and virtual uh, connections. Now we need to make that meaningful, both for the participants and for sponsors, to make that a meaningful engagement. I would add also, um, Tim, for a quick brief, you're also going to look at a specific part of the geography. New York City is not going to open up as quick as other parts of the country. So St. Louis, where Megan is, might open up quicker than Chicago. Um, so as you look to where, where are you going to have, where they're going to open, I, I would look for those safer, less, um, less uh, positive tests as well. Yeah, I think, I think it's going to be the flyover states, as they call us in the middle. Um, because we had the, we had we got to watch the coast go through it all, and then we were able to shut down a little bit quicker before things migrated so much. But I guess I'd ask Megan too. You know, as as we think about things, and I know we're talking about meetings, but the people that attend meetings do other things in their in their life, right? There's, um, but I, I guess one of the things about attending is is ban on travel that a lot of companies have put into place. But um, I guess I'd ask Megan kind of on behalf of corporate customers and stuff too is, when do you see your company saying, you know what, we've, we've cut as far as we can cut. At some point, we've got to get out and start making things happen again. What's, what's your gut feel for that? Because I think a lot of us are wondering what corporate America is going to do because you're so much of the attendance of what we talk about. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it's a great question. I think it's kind of a hard question at this point. Um, so us, Adopt Foods, we have locations all over the country. Um, we do business internationally as well. And so it really, a lot of it comes down to where the people live, where the employees live and where they're traveling to. Um, that's going to play a huge role in it. Um, you know, we have, as every company, we've set it in place uh, a lot of new policies and they change daily, weekly. Um, and so I don't think I can really answer the question at this point in time, just because it changes too often right now. Um, but I do think it comes down to where people live and work and where they need to travel to um, for their meetings or conferences. It's a, it's a really good reminder, Megan, about how we need to be listening to our constituents. And, you know, it, I, I've had a lot of people who say, let's just, let's just get out there in the next two weeks. And we keep saying, call your partners, listen to them, share, you know, there was a question earlier about sharing communications. And I, I forget, Megan, if it was you or Sean, but like, you've got to be transparent. You've got to provide reassurance. But more than anything else, we've just got to sit and listen to what they're saying. And if they're all, you know, cutting back on travel, we need to adapt the format. The flip side is, if they want to do something, but they're not sure how, how do we enable that to happen? But yeah, listening is so much more important than talking. It's, you know, I will say this, I, I love Zoom. I love all these platforms. There was a point last week where I was like, oh my God, I don't want to do another video thing on Zoom anymore. <laughs> I just want to listen to people. And I got off video last Friday and just, it was almost like a breath of fresh air to listen and not feel like I'm always, you know, I, I love the medium, but to a point. So anyway, I think listening to our customers is so important. Yeah, and you know, back to, you know, we were talking about normalcy or what the new normal might look like. We all want to be back to normal as badly as all of our suppliers and partners do. Um, so we want to travel and we want to plan events and go to um, destinations for um, events and conferences. Um, but priority as with most companies, I assume is the health and safety of their employees. And so that will always be um, first and foremost. But having those open and honest um, conversations with between each other, that is very important. And I think that's gonna help bridge the gap between what we're doing now and um, growing into the future. Yeah, yeah I would, my, I would my team add, is- I would add real quick, the, uh, if you go back to any, any meeting, what is the business objective? Why are you having the meeting? Um, and then could, does it require face-to-face? -face? Is it virtual? Is it transmedia that David shared? So I think people have to ask why they're having the meeting. And it may start with business travel. You have to go meet a customer. You may have to meet a, a supplier partner to plan a meeting. So I think we'll incubate faster. David, I'm wondering about the 179 days. I hope it goes faster when that <laughs> vaccine happens uh, because I know our group's ready to, ready to all hop on a plane and get out of here. I know, I know. It, it's it's frustrating. I think I think the, the 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 challenging part here is that word accessibility, right? I mean, if this if this vaccine, we've seen Johnson Johnson say we're ramping up production, assuming our vaccine is approved, and I'd love to see other companies do that. That's a huge risk, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I think a lot of us have been surprised by the number of incidences there have been of COVID that have not been reported, and at the same time. You know, we are in a challenge with a lack of testing, a lack of understanding where the risk is. And so, you know, we need that peace of mind. But I mean, I would love to prove wrong most of Brad's charts, right? I'd love to see things come back faster and not, re you know, resemble where it was 10 years ago. But it's all going to be in, in actual, you know, health and safety and science. And I mean, we can't say we don't have enough people working on it. I think we've got a really great global effort. But it's going to be when the facts come to light of what can be done in that peace of mind before we can see real progress. Very true. Very true. So five years from now, we're looking back on all of this and, and we're judging what's changed. What, what are the few of the things that you think would be the most prominent changes in the way this industry has been done in the next five years? I'm going to say, I got two out of three. I'll get the third one by the time I get through there. First of all, <laughs> I think we all missed a trick on contingency planning. So I'll give you a different scenario that I just heard from interviews we were doing about future of another industry. Um, I, you know, we, we have dealt with uh, the shooter security issue. We've dealt with 9-11. This one, I mean, we've had this before. We've had events that have been affected by health and safety and weather, but we probably never anticipated something quite calamitous. But like someone said to me, they were doing scenario plan. They were talking about what if, what if iPhones are proven to cause cancer? 
what would that do, right? So we need to be more stark in the way we do contingency planning going forward. Um, second thing is this whole idea of multi-platform. I mean, if, if we don't learn about multi-platform coming out of this, shame on us, because it is, especially with millennials and Gen Z, where they are, you know, they're coming straight into the multi-platform, we, we've got to really leverage that. And then I, I think the, the last piece, uh, you know, I come back to content, it's about storytelling and it's about creating unique experiences. I think Megan's right and Brad said it and Sean's touched on it, which is live never goes away, but it's got to evolve. And I think creating that unique experience, it's going to be a lot more pressure on that idea of unique in part because when you look at millennials and Gen Z, it is about having an experience that they can share virally something that's visually impactful and also something that's respectful of climate change and the environment. And I don't think we've all thought quite in those terms, but I think, and, and you know, Brad raised a good point about cost. We're gonna have to figure out how to juggle that with the increased cost and the economic impact, but it is evolving the model as opposed to trying to return to a model that once existed. All good, who else would like to take a shot? Well, D David's got the best titles, chief instigator. I think we, uh, we all might have a chief instigator within each organization, so that's something I would share. I totally agree with him on the multi-platform. Um, it was already going that way, so the last 60 days has accentuated and accelerated that. Um, I think the business models are gonna change. I think you're gonna see non-refundable uh, non deposits on contracts, the force majeure, um, and those types of things, the relationships between supplier and buyer, I, I see significantly changing. And then um, we've been dealing with this already, um, is pri privacy. So it'll be interesting to see what will happen with privacy and uh, what we do as organizers to control that privacy while still managing safety as our, one of our foremost um, responsibilities. Any other thoughts? Um, I would add that I think, and Sean or David mentioned this um, a little bit, but as a planner, how we plan and how we contract and what that really looks like. And um, because, for example, our company, we plan out for some events over a year in advance, sometimes two or three years in advance. Mm -hmm. And so really thinking strategically about, because uh, we don't know what's going to happen in two or three years or one year from now. And so really strategically thinking and having those um, contingency plans in place and those plan B and plan C is what we um, might need to do if A, B, and C were to happen. Um, I think the importance of cleanliness of facilities is going to remain a priority um, for years to come. Um, in some cases, I think it might even trump um, quality. Um, not always, but I think it, it'll be a very high priority for many people. Yeah, I, I would have sure. one last question. I sure, keep, sure. I keep your finger on the I, I keep your finger on the pulse of your attendees. What are they thinking? Where are they going? And make sure you're lit, you know, tapping in. We've got a bunch of pulse surveys going on with attendees, just like Brad mentioned. We're listening to what they're saying. So I think it's really keeping your, your ear close to the ground about what they need and then adapting. You know, um, I think the, this, this whole thing has followed the three A's that I always believe in. There has to be awareness. And then you go to acceptance and then you take action. And we're kind of in the accepting thing right now. As that awareness happened, we all went into a bit of denial, right? It's like, no, 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 travel and stuff. We're gonna, everything's going to come back. Come, you know. And now that we've gotten to acceptance and, and we're starting to look at action, I think, I think what Megan said about contracting, I, you know, I think this whole housing room block model is antiquated. I think, I think in the future, um, planners are going to be able to block rooms for their, their board, their VIPs, their big sponsors, and, and maybe key exhibitors or key customers in Megan's case. I think the rest of the people are going to be left on their own to go through Expedia or, you know, there's so many ways to book a room. And, and with the advent of Airbnb and stuff, I think that's going to be it. I, I agree with Megan. I think clean, cleanliness, uh, and, and not cleanliness, I guess disinfecting, sanitation are going to be even more important because TSA is the long tail of 9-11, right? Uh, SARS and all those things, we didn't really, you know, uh, uh, lead certified. Nobody really cares about lead certified, right? Being green and stuff, just, you know, it, it had its day. 
But I think cleanliness is going to be like TSA. I think it's going to be the long tail of this, that if you're not really, really, really uh, noticeably clean and sanitized, um, you're going to lose business. I, I think that's going to be um, the thing people expect. Just like now we go to the airport, TSA was like, oh my God, when it first happened, right? The lines and get there two hours early. We've come to accept that. Right, we were made aware. We've accepted it. And, you know, we've moved on with life. And then I, I really think the third thing, other than kindness, which I think this thing has made everybody a little kinder. I think, which was probably really needed at that time. Um, but I do think um, one of the customers, our customer advisory board, is starting to combine lifestyle things with her events. For example, um, um, engineers that are big fans of Game of Thrones and doing spin-off meetings on things like that, where they can get together and talk about business, but everybody there has, has their interest in some of this lifestyle stuff. The groups that have been the last to cancel have been lifestyle groups, whether it's amateur volleyball or cheerleading or uh, not Comic-Con, which canceled San Diego, but those kind of lifestyle groups. Uh, the NRA is a lifestyle group. Where they, no, no political statement here. I'm just saying that Lifestyle groups are going to continue to be successful. I think, um, I think business-wise, people are going to want to travel less. I grew up in this industry, you know, you don't travel, you don't move up, right? You know, I've moved 12 times. If you don't move, move out, you don't move up. I, I don't think the, the current workforce is going to go for um, 75 to 100,000 miles a year as a badge of honor. I think they're going to look at if they're the, at the highest point level in their airline and the highest point level in hotel programs, they're going to be worried about their, their uh, quality of life. I think that's going to change. That I don't think meetings are going to be as big where it's, where it's work-related, but if it's something I'm really interested in, it's, it's, it's a connection to my personal life, I think I'll attend those things. That's out of my own pocket. I can decide to go whether there's a travel ban or not. I, I would add that after, after the vaccine, I see – People traveling a lot, particularly the millennials. Um, they find business and they uh, and so I actually think we'll come back a little bit after the vaccine. So uh, we are going to shift into Q and A, and before we do, I'd like you guys, if uh, just in a word or two. Um, to give our audience some guidance in terms of what are the skills they should be having up on, um, you know, as we shift into this new norm, what are the things we should be learning and focusing on to get better? No need David's. for the wise, just, just <laughs> give the, give the, give the, uh, the advice because we're going to shift then. Listening and compassion. I think I think listening and compassion is a great it is it is fundamental. I would add really watching signals and thinking about what you might do given different circumstances. We are in an uncertain world. Organizations desperately need people who can work through uncertainty. So thinking through scenarios will help you immeasurably. That's true. People can think on their feet. Sean? Yeah, I, I think people first, it's the community, um, the compassion, but I think to be successful, we're, we're gonna in a recession, we're gonna go in a recession, even though when we get a vaccine, it's gonna be tough. So people really have to hone their business skills and their value added to their organization. Megan? Yeah, I definitely think empathy and compassion. Um, and I think everyone just needs to embrace the changes that are happening and will continue to happen. Okay, awesome. Well, we're going to start with some questions um, from the group here. So um, Expo Chicago, Tony, I'm assuming, um, asked the question about how to go about planning events when we don't know um, how long uh, this will last, um, you know, whether we'll be able to have, the, or have or cancel the event. What, you know, what do we postpone? What, how are you guys, especially... Um, with clients, how are you uh, leading them when it comes to making decisions about their events and, and uh, whether to have them or postpone them, et cetera? So it depends on the event. I, I, I would say this. Um, if you have a trade event, get your major companies on the line as quickly as possible and understand what they're thinking because their participation. So we saw Mobile World Congress Barcelona 
basically blow up, but not in, not because GSMA controlled it, because companies like Cisco and Microsoft and Verizon pulled out unilaterally. So I would say for a trade event, get on the get on the horn with your trade partners or your board members. Understand, like Megan pointed out, which is a really critical piece here, what are the corporate policies that are in play right now or are going to be in play? If you're a professional association, I'd be looking at the 60 to 70% of your attendees. Where do they come from? What are the current conditions in their originating cities? What are the conditions in your city? Do you have a match or a mismatch? And I'd listen to, by the way, both groups, because typically you have corporate partners and you've got um, and you've got professional attendees. But also for when it comes to smaller events, weddings, uh, company picnics, gatherings, I would be calibrating if you're if you're across cities, calibrating what's going on across you know your population, so you don't seem out of touch with the human side of things, with the financial responsibility side of things, and with the cultural, the brand. The piece that we've been surprised by is folks who kind of like, bing, you know, they cross their fingers and hope that things will work rather than starting to proactively manage expectations. And so, like I said, live is still alive and well in a totally different way today than it was four weeks ago, but you need to steward it through rather than wait, have hope as a strategy and then pivot reactively. Um, so it's really thinking through, and it, by the way, it's also just thinking about if you're going to postpone getting on the horn with folks that you might have not been partnering with before or venues you might not have thought of before, but think creatively. This is the one, this is a time that you can do, you can take a risk and do something you've not thought of before. You need to think about health and safety, but you can do things where it's, it's fertile territory, frankly, because of our situation. And you're not going to have that under normal circumstances. So think creatively and definitely talk to your stakeholders. Okay. I, I would add also include your supplier partners. They're, they probably want to um, host events so you can cut a favorable deal where it's um, equitable for all parties. Okay. Um, so uh, I think it was David you mentioned earlier about how you can see the use of unused, un, un op, op, optimized uh, restaurant space um, used to supplement, you know, other venues for, for purposes of spacing, et cetera. So uh, we had a question from Ozzy. Um, how, how do you think restaurants and hotels can work together to partner in revenue capture, cross marketing, and cross, utiliza cross utilization of resources? It seems like those are two categories of businesses that we're, we're asking now, but there's lots of other types, attractions, et cetera, that would, uh, would, would also benefit from this conversation. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, so I'm going to start, and then I want Brad to, to jump in here because he's closer to it than I am. But I'll say this. Um, the, the, the one thing I want to emphasize first is that I, I have heard and I have seen the uh, destination uh, tourism bureaus, the convention centers, and the hotels, and the health authorities are collaborating very closely. Restaurants that participate in an event like this will be part of that dialogue as well. So we want to be careful that you're, you're getting with different partners that are collaborating on the health and safety. Health and safety is going to become the price of entry. If you don't have that consistency, any creative use of other facilities won't occur. But beyond that, I think that we have an opportunity. By the way, food and, serv food and beverage, that service is going to change as well, right? Because people are going to be very, they're not going to be wanting going into buffets until they get to a different place. So you're going to see more of the single serve options or, you know, uh, reusable utensils, that type of scenario. But I would just say that you're, there are, in some venues, this works because they're in a urban area where you have restaurants and under, underutilized uh, showrooms adjacent to the larger venues. In some cities, the venue may be detached like you have in Savannah. So it's thinking about and really working with your destination. You know, it, it still goes back to the destination management companies and the destination authorities and tourism bureaus. They know the thick of, and thin of what that can be done and who's involved with kind of that level of health and safety. And it's leveraging their expertise in a creative way if you want to go go at your own, you can. Just be careful that you're not trying to, you know, I see people who are trying to run around with 20 different partners rather than getting them to collaborate. Sean said it very well. Get with your partners and think about how you can make this work, but also make sure that the attendees have a great experience. Even though they expect something different, they still want something great. Very good. Yeah, uh, 
And looking at, you know, looking at this from a city standpoint, I'm, I'm reminded of a saying in a group I belong to, and it's, our common welfare should come first. Personal progress for the greatest number depends upon unity. And I think that's what destinations need to realize, that, that the hotels... The hotels did what was for the hotels and the restaurants did what was for the restaurants. And then if you want to talk to the museum, you, you know, and, and, and I do think unity in a destination and everybody pulling the orders in the same direction is going to be critical to their attractiveness to those who plan events that um, you're not going to have all the answers, but your ability to connect the customer to the answers is going to be greater than ever before. And, and I think bureaus have, you know, during this time, for example, and we've had a lot of hotels shut down, we have been serving as the salespeople for some of these hotels. And we've said, look, if you don't have salespeople can handle the lead, reach out to us. We'll be happy to, you know, handle the lead for you and be your salesperson. Um, you know, we're trying to connect the restaurants to some of these cleaning solutions. And I do think that um, cities have been strapped for cash and this has really made it worse. Um, I think cities are going to be um, uh, under the gun. Um, I think it's going to be hard for um, as much as you need incentives to bring more business. I think it's going to be hard for cities to fund as many things as they did because um, the National League of Cities just reported 88% of the cities are going to um, not have enough money to, to literally meet their budget. And that's, that's just a fact. And, and I do think that that that's going to have an impact as well. So I think finding some of those city venues and finding creative spaces to, uh, you know, for example, in front of our city hall, there's a wonderful outdoor space and we're now looking at putting events there when they didn't want events there before. And, uh, so I do think a city coming together in a unified way is going to be really critical um, to provide experiences um, for attendees and to help make the organizer's job easy because they're going to have a tough enough time focusing on the attendees, focusing on answering all the questions for the attendees. And all of us, and I know Sean's company does a great job, and, you know, there's, there's just so many partners out there that um, want to be that listener, want to be the compassionate, want to be able to help the customer. Those that are looking for the transaction, it's going to be a long recovery. Um, it really is. If, if you don't see yourself as part of the solution, you're probably part of the problem. Very good. So um, we are actually coming to the uh, the end here. There's one question I thought would affect people quite a bit here, and, and you guys might have some insights. So are some of these national associations considering smaller, more frequent shows uh, and events versus the, you know, the, the major shows that we're accustomed to? Yes, <laughs> they are. Uh, we've seen uh, a notable uptick, particularly around associations and corporates that are uh, creating and they're initiating more smaller meetings, more regional meetings. They want people to get back together. And by the way, this is both for relevancy as it is for recruiting. The one thing to bear in mind, an online event has global reach if you use the right platform with the right capabilities. So some savvy organizations are looking at this as an opportunity to gather, it could be designers instead of all retailers, or you know, it could be producers. So yes, we are seeing a growth of smaller regional events. We're hearing that, by the way, from the industry surveys. Um, I think part of this is pragmatism, right? They're, they're, under the current conditions, it's hard to know when to convene a bigger event, and it's critical to sustain the community. Um, I think that the larger events will occur. They'll come in a different way. But for the, for the short term, we're going to see more smaller regional events creates opportunity and creates a way for folks to convene and connect with one another and still respect the, the situation we're in, um, which, you know, the faster we get out of it, the better, but, we, but best to deal with it for what it is and, and innovate around it. Yeah, I would add that um, many associations are in a bad way financially, a uh, potential bankrupt. So they have to innovate quickly to try to get in some revenue and keep their membership and other stakeholders engaged and active. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. We're gonna close up here. Any uh, parting thoughts, a sentence or two that, to uh, close us up here? 
Yeah, Tim, uh, first of all, thank you for, for putting this on. I've learned a lot just from listening to these folks. Um, I'd say, you know, my team keeps me very fired up. They're very excited about what's next. Whereas I'm like, you know, boy, what's going to be the new normal? They're very excited about what's next. And I think, I think for us to want to go, you know, none of us want to go back to black and white TV, right? <laughs> and to David's point, I think they're going to be large events. Half are going to be there live and half are going to be on a different screen somewhere. And it's, would you call it multi-platform, right? And, and, I, and I do think, I do think uh, losing hope right now would be crazy because I think there's a hell of a future ahead. Megan? Yeah, I mean, this is what it was said earlier, but I think just um, really thinking, of, remember to think about why you are traveling, um, think about your objectives and remember to stay compassionate and have empathy for people and embrace all the change that's happening. Um, and then it's also take it as an opportunity, this was mentioned earlier too, um, it's an opportunity to where maybe when we were afraid to change something, now is the right chance to take a, take a risk and um, try something new that you haven't done before. That's uh, really good. That's very good advice. People are definitely a little more willing to uh, uh, take risks because you know the, the the issues of and failure are just not as great because people know we're in unprecedented times. So you get a pass to try a little bit, maybe push your borders a little bit more than uh, than you're accustomed to. I think that's a really good point. Yeah, I would also say thank you, Tim, and all the panelists as well. I learned a ton today, and uh, as Megan said, take a risk, uh, be compassionate, step up, be a leader. We, the industry needs leaders. The millennials are going to take over. I think we decided that in the last hour and a half. So <laughs> Megan, we'll follow you. Over to you, David. Yeah, I, mean, I, I would say this. Tim and Dylan in particular, thank you very much. I see how you guys are bringing our community together. And I would say you're leading by example. And we owe it to you and to others to lead by connecting people around. Similarly, you know, we've seen, and I just, it's, you know, I have to call out, right? The healthcare providers, the bus drivers, the, the folks who are working the convention centers, the food service people, they're all affected. If there's one legacy that we owe to them, it's to push forward and do what we can to get people connected again, to honor not just the people who've lost their lives, but honor the people who have given so much in the last two months to protect the health, our health and safety. I think one of the things, and I hope we do this as we come back to the onsite, is to honor all those people who make our live channel work and that the folks we sometimes maybe we've taken for granted a little bit but it's a it's an acute reminder that they have literally kept us going through this crisis we owe it to them to help our communities get back on their feet and to help people connect again so i think there's a more hopefully more of a human meaning in all of this than merely we're getting together to celebrate and have a, a unique you know festival and concert so really thinking about all those people and how do we honor that going forward well, I, I think, David, that's a really good point. And um, Jane was a question that was going to bring this up. Um, but her thought of, you know, how can we help these folks? And I don't know that I, I know we don't have the time to figure that out now. But to your point, I think the idea of understanding that there's a lot of people that are depending on us um, to build this back up. And a lot of people are affected by it. So to the degree we bring everything we can to you know, the field every day and leave it out there. Um, I think it, it definitely gives you a sense of there's a lot more at stake. So um, I think that's a really, a really good thought to close. So um, thank you for joining us and a, a big, wonderful thank you to our panelists. You guys were awesome. I'd give you a standing O, but it wouldn't do any good right now because I'd be by myself. Um, but uh, I learned a bunch and um, based upon some of the comments I've seen through the chat and Q&A, it, it seems like We've, we've covered a lot, so thank you.